I'm James. Uh, a little while ago, we were running on Postgres for a post hog, uh, and we basically were running out of capacity. Um, we kind of talked about this in the database 101, but we were in a pinch to figure out like where could we move these events off of Postgres where things were falling over. Um, and we settled on ClickHouse for a couple of reasons. Uh, but mainly, this is how we turn this quaint place into our event mansion. Let me see if I can actually go, boom. Can you guys see this? Is that too big? Perfect. Right. Uh, perfect. Oh, nice. Oh, sweet, I have two screens. And this is awesome. Oh. All right, cool. So what is a ClickHouse? ClickHouse powers the index metrica, basically the Russian Google Analytics. Um, they get 20 billion events a day, over 13 trillion records in total, and uh, reports are built on the fly from non-aggregated data, which is really weird. If you look at most companies like Uber or Google, uh, where they are serving most of their reporting, they pre-aggregate. So they have a bunch of pipelines, usually in Airflow, on Hadoop, writing out data so that it's like pre-aggregated really quick to serve from. Uh, Yandex, on the other hand, was like, we don't know all the different types of reporting we're going to do. Um, we're going to build this thing out so that we can do reporting on the fly which is how ClickHouse is like really fast. So that, that's why like, that was one of the major reasons why ClickHouse is so fast is that was one of the design goals for it. Um, it's a column oriented database management system uh, it's for OLAP queries. I don't know if you guys have seen recently, there was a new one uh, we were talking about in the database 101. Uh, you have OLTP, which is online transactional processing, OLAP, which is online analytical processing. Now there's a new one, which is HTAP, hybrid transactional analytical processing. Uh, there's this new database that was made by um, the Ant Group that was just uh, open sourced. I think it's called like Ocean Database. It's hybrid. Um, I really want to take a look at it, but there are no English documents for it yet. So uh, keep keep your eye out for that one. It looks really cool. Um, but yeah, in good company. If you click this, uh, I'll send this out to the group. There's a whole list of companies that are using it, uh, including Uber now. Uber is using ClickHouse, which I didn't know. Uh, they have a talk on it. They were they were looking into using it for. Um, basically consuming and, and analyzing logs. All right, so what is a row-oriented database? We talked about this a little bit in the database 101, but basically this is how data is stored on disk. Uh, for every row, it looks like a CSV where you have uh, everything combined together. If you wanna read any section of the database, you have to read every column for every row that you're scanning over. Uh, and ClickHouse, nope, that is the end. In ClickHouse, you have, uh, Oh yeah, this is a, a GIF that they made. So yeah, for every row, um, you have to scan it. Um, Marius, can you read the top? The data, time, region, smartphone, data and time, region, phones, smartphones. Nice. So yeah, basically this is what was happening in Postgres. Um, if you're trying to do any type of analytics, it goes and it reads every, every bit of data for every row uh, that, meet, that matches the predicate, that matches the where calls which is actually a lot of data to, to process, especially when you have like a billion rows, right? Um, so what ClickHouse does and what a lot of other columnar databases do, I included them at the bottom, is they split out, they kind of turn everything around. So um, the row is the column and you only select the columns that you want to pull out, which is really good for sparse data, really good for data that has a lot of columns. That's why it's called Big Table. Uh, Big Table was one of the first databases to explore this at Google. So the idea is that you, instead of like trying to denormalize everything, or rather normalize everything into a schema that has like a bunch of tables with few columns, you, you nor denormalize things into big tables that have a bunch of columns. Um, and so what happens here is you read it like this. They, this is a little bit dramatized. Um, but you basically grab the data uh, that you need that is required for the query. So if you're only looking, like if the, the, the table has 20 columns and you're only really looking at two, like you're selecting from one and your, your where clause is on the other, you're only gonna grab two columns of the 20 columns, which really reduces the scope of data that you're pulling off disk. And in databases, like if you take one thing away from any talk on databases, reducing the cardinality of data that you pull off disk is your number one concern. If you can do that, everything speeds up. This is a wall of text, I'm sorry. OLAP use cases, um, the vast majority of the, this is something that someone asked in the last question I want, or last uh, talk, I wanted to clarify it a little bit more, I think it was Buddy. Um, the vast majority of use cases are for read access. So you're, you're writing um, not randomly, you're writing like it's in, usually append only, 
data is updated in fairly large batches, greater than 1,000 rows, not by single rows, or it is not updated at all. Um, data is added to the database, but is not modified. For reads, quite a large number of rows are extracted from the database, but only a small set of columns. Um, tables are wide, meaning that they contain a large number of columns, which we were talking about, like big table. Uh, queries are relatively rare, uh, usually hundreds of queries per server or less per second. So that's another thing. Like if you look at Postgres on like a production database, uh, it's getting a ton of queries all the time. You're interested in seeing like what's the session, like what items are in your cart. You're getting a lot of queries very frequently versus a ClickHouse database gets queries relatively infrequently. Um, it's like one request to get a dashboard or whatever. Uh, and you're not updating that again. Um, for simple queries, latencies around 50 milliseconds are allowed. Uh, column values are, are fairly small. Numbers and short strings, for example, 60 bytes per URL. Um, require, requires high throughput when processing a single query up to billions of rows per second per server. Transactions are not necessary and generally frowned upon. Uh, low requirements for data consistency. This is another really big one for a OLAP system. Uh, you know, if you're looking at a production Postgres system or a MySQL system and you have all of your items in a cart or something like that, if you refresh the page and the items in your cart are, are, are flapping, like if they're inconsistent, it's a bad experience. You wouldn't trust Amazon if you were like, refresh the page, where did my toilet paper go? Um, there is one large table per query. All tables are small except for one. Uh, there is one or uh, a query results is significantly smaller than the source data. This is a big one. Um, in other words, data is filtered, aggregated, so the result fits a single server's RAM. Uh, so we can get in that a little bit later too. All right, what makes ClickHouse special? Uh, X, so these are the reasons why we really chose ClickHouse over some of the competitors. Um, some of the competitors we looked at were Pino, uh, which was we actually used it over for um, our Eats dashboards. Uh, Presto is another one that's really good. Most of them are written in Java on the Hadoop stack. Uh, so they're backed by HDFS which is really good in a lot of ways, but it adds a lot of complexity. Uh, as for ClickHouse, another one that we looked at was TimescaleDB, uh, but the big things that why we chose ClickHouse, excellent compression, stores data on disk, so it's cheap, uh, vector computation. So real quick one on the stores data on disk. Some of these things require that all the data gets loaded into memory before you run uh, any analytics on. So Presto is a good example of that. When you run a query on Presto, which is a Facebook product, um, and we also used it Uber, which is really is really excellent product, but it has to load everything into RAM before it does any uh, analysis on it, any, any aggregations or anything like that. So if it's really good for, um, if you have giant boxes, tons of memory, but as soon as you run out of memory, it blows up. Like it, it can't, it doesn't know how to stream data off disk and then like dispose of it uh, in, in memory. Um, so this actually will store in all the data on disk. And if you run, run out of memory, it's no big deal. It does go run a little bit slower once you hit that though. Um, Real-time data updates based on sort keys. Sort data allows primary and secondary indexes. Data skipping indexes, which is really cool, something we actually don't use and I think we should probably look into using more of. Suitable for online queries, support for approximated calculations, and easy, easy replication and sharding. Does anyone have any questions so far? I'm just like going through this as quickly as I can. I have a very little other question, which I'm uh, not sure if you actually know the answer to that. So how does ClickHouse store variable length, uh, or basically say strings, how does it know that that's when this string ends, like the whole column? Uh, on disk, I'm actually not sure. Uh, it's probably some special character um, for the column, but because it's not fixed width for strings, like for everything else, that's why it's really good to use like an integer. Um, you know, they have a bunch of different types of unsigned and outsigned integers and, and floats and all that. Those are all fixed width, so that's super easy for it to scan. For this one, it's, it's going to be a little bit more tough because it could be like any size. Um, so yeah, that's a really good question. I don't know how it knows what the terminator is for a string on, on the disk. Um, anything else? All right, cool. Onward. All right, what makes ClickHouse painful. Mutations are not supported, as we know. We kind of abuse this. Uh, it does have it as a, like a DDL, an altered table statement, but it waits for those uh, parts to be merged before it, it merges those in. And you can get into a spot where the mutations, and it also will try to read these mutations piecemeal on queries. So if you have like a thousand, this is, we've had a couple outages or like regressions because of this, but um, if you have like a thousand mutations queued, 
Um, those are stored individual, ind independent of the actual data on disk for that table. And it reads the data for the table and then it reads the mutations for the query, which can slow things down big time. Um, transactions are not supported. Uh, that is actually kind of funny because it kind of does for certain things. The way that it stores the um, schema data on ClickHouse is somewhat, it's atomic, it's not exactly transactional, but uh, it, it does do handle that all inside of ClickHouse. Sparse index is not a real index, does not help with grabbing single row by key. Um, any questions about that? Connecting to ClickHouse, you have a couple different options. Uh, so you can connect to ClickHouse. Um, one of my favorite ways is through the CLI, through ClickHouse client. It gives you a really nice interface. Um, you, it tells you the status of the query. It tells you the number of rows per second that is processing. It tells you the, num the amount of data per second that is processing is pretty cool. You can kind of see like when things are, are slowing down. Um, I also forgot to, to dive into something else. The One of the other reasons why um, we chose ClickHouse over some of the other ones is the vectorized execution engine. Uh, does anyone know what a vectorized execution engine is? Does anyone know what MapReduce is? So there are a couple different ways to do like parallel processing um, on data. And one of them is like MapReduce, which is, you know, uh, which was developed at Google by, um, I'm forgetting his name, Rob Pike, not Rob Pike, that was Go. Uh, I'm forgetting his name, but basically it's this idea that you can map data out, combine it local to the, the node, and then reduce it on another node. And it makes how you approach large problems really easy because you can split it out into little bite-sized pieces. Uh, I saw this really good example of like cooking. Um, mapping and mapping would be like cutting up all the vegetables. Like you can have n number of people cutting up vegetables for you combining it into a bowl and then passing it on to someone who's going to cook it. Like one person cooks everything into one, one thing. Um, so that's not vectorized. Uh, you, you end up having multiple stages of MapReduce when you have that. Vectorized is when you come up with a DAG. So a directed acyclical graph of like processing that you need to do and nothing has to wait. So with MapReduce, you're ending up with like these stages where everything has to complete, everything's written to disk and then another wave of MapReduce occurs, um, which is really good for a large cluster, but it's, it's really batchy. It's very bad for like really quick things for, for your really sensitive latency. Um, for this, you have a vectorized approach where it's able to take everything apart, form a DAG of like what depends on what in terms of computations and just shovel it through. Um, so everything is streaming. So if you have like something way high up in this tree that's, that's going really slow, everything else is not blocked by that downstream. It can continue processing, um, which is really good. Uh, most things are moving towards this, but ClickHouse by default is a vectorized compute engine. So back to this, uh, native TCP, um, what we use for PostHog, our, our client library is, does use native TCP. You have an HTTP interface too, so you can like post to it and say like, hey, run this query. The nice thing about native TCP is it does give you status back if you want. So if we ever wanted to give like a status bar in post, PostHog, we could, we could say like your query is like 80% done. Um, it supports MySQL wire protocol. So you can actually query post, you can query click house just like it was MySQL using a MySQL client, which is kind of neat. And of course, JDBC and ODBC. So uh, Java, Java Database Connector, our client, um, you know, that's, that's how we connect to it from Metabase. The good stuff, engines. So this is probably, besides like the fundamental stuff, I think this is really why we chose uh, ClickHouse. Besides like Cloudflare using it and Sentry using it um, and just having some ex like experience around there. Um, the table engines, I think, are one of the most compelling things on, on ClickHouse. So the first one, uh, I want to go over the integrations. This is not even something that's like local to ClickHouse. This is just something that ClickHouse allows you to wrap things that are in lo other locations and represent them as, their ta as if they were tables. This is something that I think Hive does really well. Again, another Facebook product that I love. Um, but basically, it makes everything relational. So every, your, your, your common area of work is just SQL. And so you're moving data around using SQL, which is a perfect language for moving data around in. So you have table engine integrations for ODBC, JDBC. If you have something, um, buddy, are you talking? Or, because I see your, your square light up. No, I'm good. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so uh, ODBC, JDBC, you can wrap basically any database engine with ODBC or JDBC and say, hey, this is the table and you can query it through that. There are some gotchas there, it's not perfect. 
Um, otherwise, we would absolutely have wrapped Postgres around this for persons and person distinct IDs. Um, but it's there. Uh, you can wrap a table and say, like, MySQL. This table is backed by a MySQL table. MongoDB, HDFS is a big one. S3, Kafka, we use this one ex like super frequently. Um, RocksDB, RabbitMQ, RabbitMQ, and PostgreSQL. So first one, Kafka. This is how we actually get all data into ClickHouse. Uh, we don't have, like... For most databases or most data pipelines, you have some service that's sitting there consuming uh, from Kafka or consuming from like, let's say uh, when an event comes in, it's going to insert into the database, right? We don't do that. We, when the, the event comes in, it goes into Kafka, goes in the plugin server, magic happens, goes back into Kafka. And that's pretty much it as far as our stack is concerned. Um, ClickHouse handles everything else from there. So we say like we have this table, it's a Kafka engine and we've defined the schema and say, inject, like basically you can select from that table and it reads from Kafka as if it were disk locally, which is really cool. It's super powerful. Um, it also doesn't care how that data is serialized. You can have it serialized in JSON, JSON row technically. Um, you can have it serialized in uh, uh, protobuf, which is what we use for events. Uh, you could have it thrift, like it doesn't really matter. So. The cool thing there is it gives you a very raw interface into these other services so you can ingest data very easily. Um, does anyone have any questions on that? Because that's like super powerful. What is the, uh, what is the purpose of Kafka? I'm not really familiar with that. That's a really good question. Um, so Kafka is what I view is like a data pipeline. Um, so Kafka specializes in writing data sequentially on disk. Um, so it's really optimized for spinning disk. And it's a way for you to produce to a topic. Like these are the terms on it. So you produce data to a topic, which imagine is just this pipeline. And you can append only to this pipeline. And you can have multiple consumers consume from that pipeline at their own rate. Uh, so there's no like, it's no in-flight semantics like SQS where you're like, okay, I take this message, I take this message and everyone's like pulling off the queue, right? Instead, everyone has to read all the data that was ever written to it. Um, for the most part, there, there are partitions, but simplicity. Um, you're reading every, everyone's reading everything off of it together. So you can have like four different services reading the same data off of the same topic, uh, doing different things with it, right? Does that make sense? Oh yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So it's also something that protects us from downtime. So if we were to take ClickHouse down, um, we're, all of the upstream services are still writing to Kafka. It's just the offset where those consumers are um, have stopped. And so once we come back online, like ClickHouse comes up, it's like, okay, I'm gonna pick up from where I left off and it just syncs all that data into ClickHouse. So it gives a lot of elasticity to everything um, and, and fail safety. Oh, okay. Wait, um, does that mean like we have different, like multiple replicas of like ClickHouse just reading from this Kafka we stream? We do. So uh, that we'll get into in a little bit with like how we handle HA and sharding. But um, yeah, basically uh, every node, well, there are four nodes that are responsible for reading off Kafka at the moment. All right. Cool. Okay. Thanks. Anything else? And we'll, I'll, I'll make sure that we cover that like clearly too. So the PostgreSQL one I want to touch on too. So this was something that Eric and I were looking at just recently because it's, it's relatively new. Um, so we were like, oh, well, PostgreSQL uh, table engine, that sounds great. We could possibly wrap persons and person distinct IDs um, and pull data in from Postgres, which is a source of truth for that. Uh, don't, get it, don't get too excited. All joins, aggregations, sorting, in array conditions, and limit sampling constraints are executed in ClickHouse only after query to PostgreSQL finishes. So that means basically anytime you use this, it grabs all the data. <laughs> it's like, uh, it pulls it in um, and then uh, it, it will hang like there's the engine. So only one of these queries can happen at once and the engine will hang until all that data gets in the ClickHouse and then ClickHouse does its magic. Um, there are ways to make this better, but unfortunately they're only for MySQL. We'll get to that later. All right, merge tree engines. This is the magic that happens local on ClickHouse. So merge tree family is the core of ClickHouse storage. It's how most of our tables work, um, if not all of them actually, that aren't like foreign uh, engines. Features include columnar storage, custom partitioning.
to death. But we have an either a, uh, a table that is a um, merge tree. Uh, basically, creates a table that doesn't exist. Table like cool because it allows you to evict data out of the table. Um, sample by, if you want to sample, like if we have an aggregation that we want to run, if the table is, has the sample by defined, uh, it doesn't read all the data off disk. So this is a way, if, you, if we wanted to like have metrics that were fuzzy, um, kind of like Google Analytics, we could do that right now using the sample by. Um, uh, the key things here though are the the um, order by. So the order by on a merge tree is how the data gets sorted to disk and how the data gets merged later. Um, merge tree, the, the, the order by and the partition. So order by, we'll cover it a little bit, basically determines this, um, which is, I, this is literally a copy paste out of the docs because I love it. This is like the most important part of the docs in ClickHouse, I think, for how data gets stored. So imagine that you have a merge tree table that has an order by statement, count, counter ID and date. Uh, when you have that, like the order by, that's the, the primary key. Um, the sorting index can be illustrated as follows. So this is literally how ClickHouse does queries on data, um, how it figures it out, how it leverages that merge tree sort to get the data out of ClickHouse. So uh, I'm just gonna go through these and let me know if you have any questions, but um, so let's say we, we say the, as part of the query in the predicate, we say, we, I want all the data that it has counter ID in A or H. The server will read the data in the range is marked um, 0, 3, 6, 8. So it's really um, uh, 0 inclusive, 3 exclusive, 6 inclusive, 8 exclusive, uh, if I'm reading that right. Um, so basically, let me get my mouse over here. Oh, my mouse doesn't work over here. So imagine just following along here, uh, you want all of A and all of H. So you're gonna like look at the marks. The marks are they're kind of the secret to this. So it summarizes what data is in what blocks on disk. And so it, it, the first thing ClickHouse does is it goes and looks at these marks and says, okay, well, where are all of the A blocks? And it says, okay, well, A is in zero, one, two, and three exclusive. All right, where are all the H blocks? Seven, uh, six, seven, eight, and it, has, it does six, seven, eight, because it wants, it doesn't know where H starts, right? Um, so it wants to cut, to grab the, uh, the, the bits on the side, just to be sure. So we talked about reducing cardinality, reducing the amount of data pulled off disk. This is a super cheap way of doing that, just based on how the data is stored on disk, like the nature of the data being stored on disk. There's, there's no real index to keep here, um, which is really sharp. Uh, so yeah. Same thing with like count counter ID N A H and date equals three. Um, it knows that it can just like do the uh, the intersection of those two. You end up with one, two, three, and seven and eight. Um, pretty straightforward. Does anyone have any questions on this? And the same thing with date equals three. Uh, you can go through there and be like, okay, where what uh, which one of these has three in it? Which is one through ten. <laughs> So the thing that you're trying to avoid always is do avoiding doing a full scan, which is what Postgres will end up doing if you don't have an index on something. With this, as long as you, as long as you have a predicate on your sort keys, uh, you're able to reduce the cardinality to some extent. Um, um, one question here. Yeah. Um, for the third bullet point, date equals three, why does it search in one to 10? So because it's sorted uh, prime first by counter ID and then date, it knows that for these blocks of uh, A, 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 B, E, E through. So it's, it's basically, um, and this is also based on the mark size. When it takes these samples inside of the data, it knows that uh, because it is secondarily sorted by, by that date, um, it needs to start at one because two has three in it, right? So the first key is A. It's trying to find the first, sorry, let me, let me try to just 
like to explain this more clearly. Um, the first key hasn't changed, but it's gone. The second key, which is the one that you're trying to equal on, has changed. And it wants to be inclusive, so it doesn't know where that it flipped over two, three for the date. So it's going to include one. So that's the, the left side. For the right side, it's going to say, okay, well, what's the last block, the last mark that had three in it? And three is the upper bound here. So it's going to be the end in this case. But let's say there was a four. Um, if there was a four, it would actually use that four because it doesn't know where the end is uh, because it would be ambiguous. Um, so it's going to scan that entire block. The only block that it's going to emit here is A1 because it knows for sure that there won't be any threes in there because that's A1, A2, A3 is the first three marks. Does that make sense? I see. Um, sorry, uh, just to confirm I understood this yeah. correctly. If date were equal to two, then it would start at zero and end at seven Correct. for same reasons. Uh, seven, uh, it would probably stop at nine because okay. it doesn't know whether or not I has two. Right, right, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, because, but because that's the only way it's going to know for sure, for certain, that I doesn't have it to, uh, because it doesn't have like you know the, the marks are arbitrarily like they're spaced out arbitrarily, so there might be a two sneaking in there. Um, right. So, so yeah. it still doesn't change my follow-up question. Uh -huh. Even if it stops at nine, but we still have a two between nine and ten. No, because of sort. Oh wait, yes, you could because of L. Sorry. Uh, yeah. So you you absolutely could have. Um, you could have a two in there. Yeah, if that was I instead of L, then no, uh, it would it would have stopped at nine. But because that is L, yes. I see. Okay. Does that make sense to everyone? It's pretty cool. It's like the, I love simple and elegant solutions to problems like this. Uh, you know, it's not perfect. It's very stochastic, but. It's, it just simplifies the problem so much. Uh, so yeah, something though that I'd love to get more into is the um, sparse secondaries. Like I think that's really, really cool and we don't use. All right, so table engine, repl repl replacing merge trees. You probably have heard of this before. Um, this is what we use for most of our tables, uh, replicated version. Um, deduplicates based on the sort keys, uh, replaces rows that have the same sort keys by some order key. Sometimes works, usually doesn't. So uh, this is like basically what is the stem of a lot of the problems that we've had with person person distinct IDs. Um, the idea here is that ClickHouse will self deduplicate when a new version of a row comes in and the sort keys match. It should prefer that new version based on um, the version column that we have set. Uh, you can kind of see in the replacing merge tree the only parameter that it takes is the version, which is the version column. Uh, whatever has the highest integer number in that version column should be the one that is is uh, preferred on merge. But the issue that we've had with this one is that the table rarely merges, if ever, and we end up with duplicates when you when you select on what you think is a primary key that is unique, um, and you end up with multiples coming back. So this is. Does anyone have any questions on this one? Why doesn't it work? I don't know. No, I have no idea. I uh, should, like they basically say it should. Uh, we even do the optimize and optimize final, which should force it to do the merge. Um, but I'm not sure. It could be something that's fixed in a newer version. Um, we're on a relatively new version already though. But uh, yeah. Is there something we're not understanding about the the version key that we're trying, that we're setting? Because I mean, anecdotally, I think the collapsing table, I mentioned this, that we set up for cohort people, that actually did work. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it could be that I know a hypothesis that I have not tested is like, it could be that because we're doing so many mutations on this table that it never gets a chance. Um, that would be my guess because like they basically say in the docs, like this is the table you should use for everything. Like this is the best table that we have. Um, but for us, we've seen some really weird stuff, but we are abusing ClickHouse the way that we do use ClickHouse, like with the mutations. So it could be that ClickHouse is just literally never it just never caught up and is unable to do this merge and deduplication um, because well, it is very my, the mutations should be uh, limited now right or they should almost be gone because we're doing the deleted column that we mm -hmm. have to do. so have we have we looked into seeing if this is merging now 
I haven't checked. I can check later. Yeah, it'd be it'd be curious if it like just started merging. That'd be amazing. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, it's definitely it's kind of a pain because it it looks like it's a really great solution to deduplication, but in practice, we've seen it not do a great job at deduplication. All right, collapsing merge tree. This is what Eric was just talking about. This is what we would like to move more towards. Um, this asynchronously deletes pairs of rows. If all of the fields in a sorting key are equivalent, except the particular sign field sign, which can have a one or a negative one value, rows without a pair of caps. So this is really cool. Um, I, I really like this one. We've had a couple different iterations of tables that have had this, but basically the idea, and Yandex uses this quite a bit. Um, basically the idea here is you, for a new, new row, you emit the row, has all of the columns, and the sign is positive one. Now, if you want to delete that row, you emit the same exact row, but the sign column is negative one. When you query it, you say, give me all of the rows we're having the sum of that sign be greater than zero. So that means that you give me all the rows that have not been canceled out with a tombstone row because that negative one is a tombstone. Um, it's really good. So, and as things are collapsed, as things are merged on the database, it automatically reduces these rows together um, that, that don't sum up to greater than one. So it's really elegant, really simple. Like this just standard click house stuff. Like it's super, like super simple solution, works really well. You do have to write some queries around it, but it works. Um, as Eric was mentioning, like on the, ta the test table that we have, like it's actually reducing these rows together, which is kind of neat. Um, does anyone have any questions on this? Because this is a really, really cool one. And it's something that you'll probably see a lot more of as we, as we invest in it. Does to, do tombstones make sense to everyone? Wait, uh, how, do, how, how do tombstone rows get like added? Or do you just... You have to admit it. So uh, that's part of the pain of this table is you have to know the previous state. You have to get the previous state. You just can't say like, hey, delete like row one, two, three, like you could on Postgres, right? Um, on this one, you have to say, well, the previous state is this and it is no, like, I want to delete it. So negative one, uh, which requires like running to a different database and grabbing it or having that available in memory. Um, it also opens you up to a little bit of some race conditions because potentially things have changed. Um, but the nice thing is, is even if you are uh, at least once is the guarantees that you're using here and you have a bunch of different nodes that are like, delete, 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 delete. Um, what will end up happening is that you'll have a bunch of negative one signs. And so the sum will just be negative, negative something, which means that it will automatically be disregarded because it's not greater than one or greater than zero. Um, so cool. Yeah, it works out pretty well. It's, it's not exactly perfect. You wouldn't want your bank account working on this because it'd be weird, um, but it works really well for like what we're trying to do. Uh, I, for like a, a continuation of this is the versioned collapsing merge tree, which is the same exact thing, except for you have a version on it. So the nice thing about this is to kind of get rid of that issue where you might like, if you have at least once processing, you might be emitting a bunch of new versions of a row leading to a bunch of ones in the sign column, right? And what happens in that case is you'll end up with a bunch of duplicates, uh, potentially. And this will reduce it based on version. So it will go one, one beyond the sign and it will look at the version and say, what's the newest version of this row and pull that one and return it. Uh, oh, and it's on you to write that query, but when it merges it, it does it based on those rules. So um, they, they call this out there in the docs, like this is not efficient way to select data. Don't use it for large, large tables because you have to do all of this. Like basically you have to sort every row um, based like grouping by all of the other fields to get the most recent version um, based on that version column. So it, that gets expensive really quickly. Summing merge tree. So this is, this is, we're getting into the aggregating merge trees, which we don't use too much. We've used it a couple of times to like try to figure out the most recent versions of things. Um, but these are really funny and interesting. So just like the other ones, these, like all these merge trees, are merging and they're trying to reduce the number of columns. And so far we've just been eliminating columns based on some rules. Well, it turns out not only can you eliminate columns, you can, you can, do, you can do aggregates on these, these merges. So as they're merging together, you can say like, we'll sum up the values. Uh, so if you have like a materialized view, for instance, where the materialized view is just a bunch of aggregates based on dimensions, uh, as the table is compacted on disk, 
it'll do that aggregation for you. And next time you hit it, you're getting less data on off of disk. It's perfect. So similar to a collapsing merge tree, except it does math at merge time. Some is the merge row, sometimes partially, something to know. Like you still have to do the select key sum value from the table and group by. But it's not like automatic. None of these tables are automatic for the most part. Does anyone have any questions about this? Because it's kind of cool. All right. So stepping deeper into this, the aggregating merge tree. <laughs> so this is basically a more generic version of the summing merge tree. You can specify the aggregation you want to occur on the table at merge time. Uh, so this is probably my, my favorite example of this out of the docs. You can create materialized view and say that this, the engine for this materialized view, we'll get into materialized views later, um, is gonna be an aggregating merge tree. Uh, and that you want the, like in the select, you're having the sum state and unique state functions run on this. Um, so as this thing merges together, it will automatically run these functions on this table uh, and save the results for you as it, as it merges. So again, all of this is an effort to reduce the amount of data that you pull off disk at read time. So James, uh, we, yeah. quick question. Would we use something like that to get like uh, a count of unique users, for example? Yeah. Yeah, you definitely could for a time period. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because basically as things merge together, it'll uh, it'll just combine things. Um, and the cool thing is there are partial, like we're, we're not really gonna get into it for this because we don't have time, but there are aggregate functions that are partial. So you can like output a partial count and then continue aggregating on that. So if you have like a unique count that you want, you can apply a function. I forgot the name of the function, but um, you can apply a function to that group and then continue summing off of that group in the future. And your unique count is still a unique count. Right, because generally when you when you do a, just a sum of like unique counts, you can never add like back. You can never in, like oh yeah, we forgot this one unique ID. Add this to the unique count. You can't because it doesn't like you've lost that set. Um, it actually has functions for you to do that so that you can use those aggregating merge tree uh, and table engines and still maintain a proper unique count on on the aggregate. So yeah, so though, we don't we don't use it consistently because. Um, it can't, you can't like dynamically filter properties, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So that would be the big problem there for like, if, if you wanted to add a bunch of dimensions to the count um, for distincts, yeah, it, you'd, it would get really big really quickly for yeah. sure. And you can't arbitrarily, like you'd have to set, you could do it, but you'd have to set some dimensions for that. Um, you couldn't have arbitrary dimensions in the props. You'd have to split out like every property in the, the properties and have them as dimensions in that table, um, which would get really gnarly really quickly. Does that make sense? Okay, so graphite merge tree. Uh, who knows about graphite? So graphite is um, a time series database. It's like, it used to be the biggest, instead of like Grafana you used graphite with carbon um, and whisper, if I remember right. But basically these are ways that you can store uh, time series data on disk and the way that it, it merges together, it, it would also merge. Um, the way that it merges time series together is you have very high granularity for a period and then a reduced granularity and a reduced granularity and a reduced granularity as time went on. So like the data for the last week was very high granularity. You could go in there like and look at the data by the minute, then it would collapse that down and aggregate it by like hour. And so two weeks ago, you could look at the data by hour. Three weeks ago, you could look at it by day, like that type of thing. Um, this engine supports that. And the cool thing about that is it means that the, the space on disk is constant. So you can say like you allocate the, the space on disk and you can have effectively like for your, your time window, like constant data, very, very small um, in terms of size on disk. Uh, this engine is designed for thinning and aggregating, averaging uh, roll up data for graphite. Um, this is basically a replacement table for graphite if you want to power graphite with ClickHouse. Pretty neat. We could use it someday. Um, not something we're going to use anytime soon, though, I think. Uh, yeah. Replicated merge tree engine. So we talked about uh, master master or like HA master master replication. Like how do we do replication here? Um, how does anyone do replication with ClickHouse? And this is also one of the reasons why we chose ClickHouse. Replication on ClickHouse is actually pretty easy and it's on a per table basis. So the entire database is not replicated by default. You have to say this table is replicated and you have to set it up 
like this. So um, the cool thing about it is it's master master. You can write to any node and it will be distributed across the cluster automatically to the replicas. Um, and replication is co coordinated by Zookeeper. So ClickHouse is like, I don't, I, I, boss, I just write, write the stuff to disk. Um, Zookeeper is what's actually keeping track of what data exists where and what replicas need to be updated, like what's missing on each replica. Um, and the, the nodes talk to Zookeeper to figure out like, where do I need to send data? Or where can I grab data from um, that's up to date? So how do we make a replicated table and what parameters do we need? Actually, not that many. So uh, if you look here, uh, the, the, the engine equals replicated merging, re replicated replacing merge tree. Uh, all you have here is a location on Zookeeper. This is a, a node, a ZK node, but it's a folder. Like don't, don't let the terminology scare you. It's nothing more than just a path. Um, so here you have layer, shard, uh, and table name and replica. And ignore the version that's just for the replacing merge tree. Um, so what happens here is for uh, Yandex, they actually use two layers of sharding, a layer and a shard. We don't do that. That's for like very large installations. We only have four nodes, so we only have two shards. Um, but basically, uh, if you want to talk about layers layer, it's really cool. This is actually how they, um, they split things up by customer. The layer is the customer. But for sharding, uh, we basically have two shards um, and the replica. So when you have the shard, it's pretty much ignored at this stage. Don't worry about it. Like this is only how to replicate the data that's on this node. Um, and the replica at the end is how it figures out like what data is missing or what data is needed to Zookeeper. Everything else here is actually pretty static. So the shard and the layer on the first on the, on the term here, um, the table name in, Z, in Zookeeper, it doesn't determine anything really for the replicated table. Uh, I know I'm getting like really into the weeds of this one, but just so you know, uh, that that doesn't, the repl replacing or the replicated table does not use that at all other than knowing like I'm table X, Y, Z. Uh, the replica at the end is what it actually uses for figuring out what data it needs when it's talking with the other nodes. Does anyone have any questions on that so far? Okay, so I'm gonna cover the shard bit a little bit more here. So I said that this, uh, the, 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 the path is the sharding doesn't matter. It's true, the way that that works and the reason why it doesn't matter is because um, when you're replica replicating a shard, it only cares about what data is on that shard. It doesn't know about how it's sharded. It just knows that like shard one is a totally different table in terms of replication from shard two. Does that make sense? Okay, yeah, because the like like in terms of re replicating data from from node A to node B, if it, if node A and B are re are replica one, it does not, or rather shard one, it does not care at all about what's on shard two on C and D. So that that's like the key thing that, the, to know here. You really have to like get into the weeds of how how replication and sharding works on ClickHouse. But because of that, there's no surprises. It's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, it's just kind of weird how they have it like the implementation de details kind of surfaced so much. Okay, so log engines, uh, don't use these. <laughs> uh, they're good for temporary tables and for testing. Uh, they're basically just like flat files that it puts on disk. You have Stripe log, log and tiny log. Um, I'm not really gonna go too much into detail. Uh, basically look into them if you wanna test. Like if you wanna create a real quick table or if you wanna load some data onto ClickHouse and not have it be in a merge tree, this is what you wanna use. Otherwise, stay away. Special engines. All right, so the uh, first one is distributed. So we were just talking about replication. This is what we use on top of replication to get to achieve sharding. So the way that we work, like the way that sharding works on ClickHouse is that you wrap your tables with a distributed table and you tell the distributed table how you want to shard those, the, the writes to the underlying tables. So you can write directly to a shard manually if you know what you're doing. So like if you if you were like, hey, look, I don't want to induce a bunch of network load on the cluster because that's what happens with a distributed table. Um, you can say, I want to write directly to shard A because I, I know this data belongs to shard A. Um, versus when you write to a distributed table, you can write to any node. So any of the four nodes in the cluster, technically six nodes in the cluster, you can say, insert this row and it will look at it and say, okay, well, I know that this data belongs on node A. 
and I'm not node A. So you're having to traverse the network to get to the first node, and then you're gonna have to traverse the network to get to the other node. And if it's a lot of data, that could be expensive. So uh, a distributed table wraps sharded tables across the cluster and provides a single point for reads and writes. It also knows how to re read data off of the cluster um, and the shards and the replicas. On write, automatically forwards the data to the correct shard for final writing. On read, splits reading data across the cluster in a way that speeds up IO and pushes down processing to be most lo mostly local to the instance. So um, it, when you re write, what, rather, when you query a distributed table, it splits that query up and pushes down the queries so that they're running locally on the shard that has the data. Um, it'll also do this with replicas. So uh, let's say you have a bunch of, of nodes for ClickHouse, but they're not sharded at all. It's just a bunch of replicas of the same data. It actually knows it, how to split that up so that it can take advantage of those read replicas to get more IO out of the cluster. So it'll split that query up in a little bits and say, okay, A, you're gonna take this, B, you're gonna take this, C, you're gonna take this, even though A, B, and C have the same data. Um, it's able to split that, that into smaller chunks and then push it down to the nodes, which is really nice. Um, and you can you can set like how parallel you want it to be with that max parallel replicas uh, setting. Any questions on this so far? Um, how does it how does it uh, handle like failures during write and read? Like how does it know where to pick off pick up where it left off? So that's based on uh, Kafka actually. So the way that we um, I think it might be the next one. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, uh. <laughs> Yeah, okay, so we'll get to it. I'll just jump forward to it because it's a good question and we're running out of time. So materialized view. The way that we do this in Kafka is the Kafka table, when you select from the Kafka engine, it will read the data from Kafka and whatever offset it last read, it will commit that offset to the consumer group. So it'll say like, hey, like I, I'm up to date up until here. And that data is effectively gone from the table. So if you select from the Kafka table over and over, you're actually effectively like moving that, that consumer offset forward a bunch and that data is gone. Like you have to reset the consumer group to get it back. So what, wow. what this does is you have the Kafka table backed by a materialized view table and a materialized view table on a loop queries the Kafka table and inserts that data into its underlying table. So for events, as, we, as we're on this loop pulling off Kafka, if there's an outage, um, like upstream, let's say Kafka dies, or like there's a failure inserting into um, the, the event table downstream, or like let's say there's a issue with the distributed table inserting it downstream, which I think was the, the question. Uh, as this loop is going on, that materialized view is trying to push to the distributed events table. If that fails, it will reset the, the consumer group offset back up. So this, this, if this query fails for the materialized view, the Kafka off offset is pushed back up, which is really nice. Like it's really, really sharp. Um, so effectively it will try and it'll keep trying if it, if it never works, um, but it'll try until it, it, it can reestablish a connection to one of the shards and push that data down. And then it just continues again. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah, the, yeah. the Kafka materialized view combo is like chef kiss. It's, it's so good and so basic. Um, we use that everywhere for, for everything. Okay. So distributed table or distributed engine. Uh, other special engines, we have dictionary, merge, file, null, set, join, URL, view. So the cool ones here, dictionary is actually one that they suggest that we use more of for um, like dimension tables. It's a way to put things into memory. Uh, if you are joining on something very frequently, uh, you put it in a dictionary and it'll just come in there and like really make joins fast because joins are not fast in ClickHouse, like almost full stop. Uh, merge is basically you can merge tables together. File, you can wrap a file. Null is cool because it's dev null. You can write and read from dev null. It's the, it's the most scalable thing you can do. Um, set is a set. So you can insert things into a set. Like let's say you just wanted to have a table that represented all of the distinct IDs out there. You can use that. Uh, join is an engine that does a join. It's kind of interesting. Uh, URL, you can query an endpoint as a table. Weird. Uh, so you could technically have an endpoint that returns a CSV and you select from this table engine and it will go and grab that CSV and voila, you have a table. It's kind of cool. Also, I'm sure it's slow. Um, <laughs> other special engines, memory, buffer, generate random, external. So memory is exactly what it sounds like. It's an in-memory representation of the data, no compression, very fast. Buffer, it's the same thing. 
Um, it, ex it eventually will get flushed into a real table. Uh, generate random, excellent for testing. You can generate a bunch of random data, kind of neat. Um, external, not really a table engine, but lets you build queries more dynamically from the command line, an example on the bottom. Uh, it's pretty niche. All right, we have four, three minutes and 30 seconds. Um, um, how much more do we have of table engines? Okay. Quick, quick question, James. Yeah. Uh, can a table have more than one engine? No, yeah, well, only one engine. Um, so we talked about materialized views. So real quick, this is a really important one. Uh, a view is just a saved query. When you, when you query the table, it executes the, the SQL that's stored behind the table. That's it, it's, it's, a, it's a view. Um, materialized view is you can create a materialized view uh, that has SQL backing it and it, it on a loop will query itself, like really it's when data shows up in the, the source table and it will sync it into another table that is backed by a different table engine. Um, so it's, it's like a pipeline effectively. Um, we use this one a lot, it's really good. Any questions on that? <laughs> um, yeah, that's an example of uh, a materialized view. Oh yeah, and populate. We, we haven't gotten into like how to create these in super, super detail, like there's populate and not populate. If you create a materialized view without populate, it won't go back in time and fill in the gaps. It will basically do everything from that point forward. A little gotcha to know about. Table engines, uh, table functions. Just like Django, you can have a table engine or a table function. A table function is just a function. So you can select star from one of these table functions and kind of create an engine on the fly and a query without having to like name it and create a table, which is really nice if you think about it. So you could be like, hey, I have this Postgres instance and I want to select all the data off of this test table, um, test.test. .test, and here's the Postgres username, here's the Postgres pa password. And it'll go out, connect to it and pull the data in. Uh, you have uh, HDFS S3 numbers, generate run numbers gen and remote, um, which is uh, basically querying another table on a different ClickHouse cluster using this remote function. All right, I'm gonna stop there. <laughs> because there's a whole lot more, but that's basically we've covered all of the um, table engines. Does anyone have any questions so far on this? Um, oh, go, go ahead, Eric, go first. I was going to say for the distributed engine that we use, so we use, the, uh, I don't know if you mentioned this, but everyone, um, for everyone listening, we use the distributed engine on events. Um, how is that ordered? I was looking at the show create. Is there like an order to that, or it, you have to look at the underlying tables? Um, so the ordering is in the sharded events tables. Uh, so basically, that it doesn't care about the order; it just pushes everything down. It knows like what the underlying sort order is, but I don't think there's a way to expose that. Like you don't define that when you're creating the distributed table. You just tell it like what you want to shard on. Um, but yeah, if you look at the underlying, like if you describe that, it'll tell you what tables underlie it, and it's the the sharded events table have the sort. Oh, okay. How many what slides are left? Uh, <laughs> too many. Um, not many, actually. Uh, we basically go into um, the database engines and then some querying uh, stuff. But I'd like to actually do more on the querying side. Um, I, had, I, I, did, I thought we would get a little bit farther than we did. But there are a ton of really cool um, uh, functions on the query side that we can use that are are kind of neat. We at the last offsite we we went like super deep into some of them. They're really weird, um, yeah. Window functions and and whatnot. They have uh, combinators and parametric functions that are really interesting too. The combinators are weird because you can like build your own functions from functions. Is there one big thing you'd like everybody to take away from this talk? <sighs> um, yeah, there are there were a couple things uh, that I wanted to talk about down here. Um, this is probably the the biggest preware join sample and limit by are kind of neat. So preware. Typically, when you select from the database, you have the where, right? So you're trying to limit how much data is returned. Um, but, and it will try its best to figure out like how to efficiently grab data off of disk to, to satisfy the, the predicate before grabbing all of the data. 
But if you know, if you have a query that's going slow, or if you know that you just want to filter by something very small first and then get all the rest of the data, you can say, hey, pre-where this, which is a separate predicate in the, the, sequ the select statement, and say, like, before you do anything, go and check like the team ID or the, the, the distinct ID, and then execute the where from there. ClickHouse is generally smart enough to do that by itself, but something to know, something to test is using a pre-where. So you can just say like, hey, like filter this first and then grab rows that are returned from there. Like then figure out what to grab from there. Um, joins, this is something that gets a lot of people. Um, I've seen over the years and just in, in a couple of databases, always have the large table on the left when you're doing a join because the table on the right is hashed into RAM and the ha and a hash join is used to join the two. You'll blow out memory if it's large um, and then it'll fall back to using a merge join, which is slower. Um, suggest to load any kind of dimensional data into a dictionary table for quick reference if you're joining it on the right side frequently. So I, I mentioned that about the, 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 uh, the dictionary table engine, but basically the, bi the big thing here is just make sure that the big table's on the left on your joins. Um, like it will speed things up a lot. If you don't care about uh, the accuracy or like the exact accuracy of your aggregates, use sample because we, we have sample on most of our tables. So you can sample by um, different things and get a smaller, like a quicker result that is a little fuzzy. And then limit by is really cool. So this, I actually didn't know about this until yesterday. Uh, you can select and limit by ID. So you can say like, give me the top two uh, things by ID here and the results will look like that. So you'll get four results if you have two IDs in there, which is kind of neat. Um, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Uh, if In terms of like, those are the big gotchas. Everything else is I just wanted people to understand like how the cluster worked, like what we have, uh, like what options we have in terms of storing data, um, how, the, how this stores data in general, like the secondary indexes I'd like to look more into, but yeah, those are the, my main goals. Great talk, okay. thanks, James. Great question. It's the join bits, like very specific to ClickHouse, or is it like a general thing for databases? It's One last question. For, for OLAP databases, it's it's pretty it's pretty usual. Like Hive is the same way. Um, I think Presto was the same way, but basically, like it it doesn't on Hive. The thing was, it didn't like it does now, but it used to be that it had no idea what the underlying data looked like at all. It had no st summary statistics on the data. And so if you were to tell it, like put the, the join order wrong, it would try to load like the biggest table ever into memory and it would just blow up um, and your reducers would cry. But if you're curious also, this is our ClickHouse cluster. We have a total of 208 vCPUs, 1.6 terabytes of memory, 30 terabytes of NVMe and 16 terabytes of GP3 EBS. So it's a big cluster. And 50 gigabit per second networking on these things. I do not get why we spent that much money on AWS. Uh, we don't have to. Um, we could definitely we can we could shrink this down. We'd have to get rid of a couple of our customers, though. <laughs> uh, we we are set for a long time. Um, basically, uh, a while ago when we were having some of the performance issues, it was like, like just fix it. Don't worry about the cost. Like do something that we won't have to worry about for a while. And this was it. So. We've got it's actually not too bad considering like we have a long runway for performance. And this gives people a really good user experience, even as we're trying to like improve the queries that we have and make them more efficient. Well, cool. Thank you guys for showing up. And if you have any questions at all, just reach out. <laughs>